Okay. So we continue. We are now on question five. A function f is determined, is defined on an interval i, determine whether f is continuous on i. So you are checking for continuity on an interval. Now remember, continuity, we said, if f of x is continuous, then one, f of c is defined okay to the limit as x goes to c of f of x exists in three that limit as x goes to c of f of x which exists is the same as f of c whether on an interval whether on a point on anything this is what makes a function continuous now we go to question a the function you're dealing with is f of x is equal to one over x squared plus one and the interval i is x such that negative one is less than x, which is less than five. Okay. Is a function continuous? So let's check. Let's check. one f of c is equal to one over c squared plus one for for all c in i so whatever value of c that you pick in i and you want to find what it is um, what it is when you substitute in f of of x, you will get one over c squared plus one, which is defined because the denominator will never be zero in the interval i. Okay. From there, we go now to the second one. We are saying that the limit as x goes to c of this function one over x squared plus one is going to be one over c squared plus one for all c in i and so the third property is just saying that the limit as x goes to c of one over x squared plus one is equal to one over c squared plus one and this is equal to f of c hence f of x is continuous on on i so this one was direct because there are no hiccups in the denominator we go to b b f of x is x over x minus one for i x such that negative three is less than x, which is less than one. If one was included on the right here, this is less than one. If it was less or equal, we are going to, uh, to find ourselves in trouble in trying to check for continuity here. Now, one is not part of this i. It's just a boundary. So everything will follow as A. So you have step one, step one, F of C will be C over C minus one for all C in I. 
and the limit here as x goes to c of f of x is going to be c over c minus one and the third property just comparing and those two are the same so f of c is the same as the limit as x goes to c of f of x which is c of c minus one hence continuous on i so that is not there's nothing much there then could there be something nice okay let's do g yeah so yeah because c also is just a direct substitution so let's do d oh i do d from the other page d f of x is equal to x squared uh, plus x minus 2 over x plus 2 and negative 3. But for what domains? When x is not equal to negative 2, when x is equal to negative 2. Now check for continuity in i where i is this interval okay now look we look at the upper function the upper piece remember this function is a piece function mean that is defined in two pieces one this f of x you find it to be x squared plus x or uh, minus two over x plus two if you if your x is not negative two for as long as what you are having in your hands as x is not negative 2, this f of x is an have written now x squared plus x minus 2 over x plus 2. Immediately you find yourself with negative 2 and you are taken to f, just know that your function will be negative 3. So now, for this function, you know you can do a lot of mathematics here. We can factorize the, um, the numerator with factors x squared minus x uh, plus 2x minus 2 over x plus 2. And this is x, x minus 1 plus 2, x minus 2. I mean x minus one over x plus two. This gives us x minus one, x plus two over x plus two. So it crosses and so you get x minus one. Okay, so when you have this, if you want, you can even sketch. Say, okay, let me see what I get. Especially when x is negative 2, the first thing I do is I substitute in my f of x so that I don't make a mistake there. So when x is negative 2, you will get negative 3. So you substitute there by putting a hole and allow your function to blow. It goes all the way down. It goes this side. Okay, that's your function. Now, when x is equal to negative 2, now you go back to that piece. When x is negative 2, the function is defined to be negative 3. So you come back and close this hole. By the definition of the other piece, you close this hole. So the one in red is closing by the definition of the other piece. Now the function is closed, so it's continuous everywhere. But that's not enough. You don't just say, as you can see in the graph, no, no, no. No one asked you to sketch. You sketched it on your own. So don't force us to see using your, using your sketch, which may not even be correct. 
because most of you just say, as you can see in the, in the sketch, no? So now you say, checking for the properties, one, f of c, okay, is equal to c minus one for, for all c in, for all c in i. Okay, except, should we accept? No, because even if we accept the negative two, you find out that it's giving the same outcome. So you say for all C in there, provided that X, X I mean, provided that your C, your C, your C is not equal to negative two. Okay. Then two, the limit the limit as x goes to C of our function f of x is equal to C minus one. Okay. Again, for C, not negative two, but for C, in I. Third, this same limit as X goes to C of F of X. Now it's C minus one, which is the same as our F of C. So we're doing this for C not equal to, for C in, for C in I, and we're excluding negative two. Okay, now, when C is equal to negative two, what we have, negative two is in I. So what we have, we have one, F of, um, we have F of C, B equal to the same value that C minus one gives, because this value is going to be negative two minus one which is it? Well, actually, don't even say anything. Just say f of c is going to be negative, negative three. Two, the limit as x goes to the c of f of x, okay? At that point, remember the limit? The limit, um, you can even specify now. You say the limit as x goes to negative two of negative three is equal to negative three. And so the third one is that these guys, the limit as x goes to c of f of x is equal to f of c, which is negative three, okay? And this negative three is not by coincidence that they are the same as C minus one. So you check that if you wanted during this procedure here, you would have been showing that including when C is equal to negative two, I will still get C minus one, okay? Because at a point where it was not supposed to be defined, it's, it became that when you substitute, for well, this negative three, if you take negative two in there, the point of exclusion, we take negative two in F of X is equal to X minus one you bring negative two here, you get negative three. So it makes this valid, that valid. And so you are saying, hence the function is continuous on, on I without any exclusion. Okay, so that was question five. Now we move to question six. Define f of c so that the function is continuous. A, f of x is equal to x minus one is equal to x plus two of x minus one, provided x is not equal to 
one. Now define continent at C is equal to one. So what you do is when you do this, you remain with it, x plus two. And then, so now your f of x is x plus two. Now, if you go and substitute this in here, you get one plus two, which is three. So to make this function continuous, you just redefine it, make it a piecewise function. So you say, you tease this very function before I touch it over x minus one, provided x is not equal to one. But when x is equal to one, the only way it can be defined is when you allow it to be three, when x is equal to one, so that the top one will open. Remember if you are to sketch this one, it will be opened at, at one. Because one is not allowed to be substituted in the f of x that you have already defined. So now, when you take one there, you get three, then you open. Then this one takes you to go and close there. So everything gets organized. You do B, what do you get there? B again, f of x um, is equal to x squared minus three x plus two, over x squared minus four, okay? For x not equal to plus or minus two. Now check at c is equal to two. We just interested at one point, c is equal to two. So if you define your function there, you can factorize the top one by having x squared minus x minus two x plus two over x minus two x plus two different uh, difference of two squares down there then on top we have x minus one minus two x minus one over x minus two x plus two so you get x minus one x minus two over x minus two x Plus two. So we test that C is equal to two. Okay. So then those was there much need? Okay, yes. So this part and this part gets cancelled. We remain with x minus one over x plus two. Now in this function at f of x, if we substitute two, we'll get two minus one over two plus two, which is one over four. When we have one over four, what do we do? We now say, okay, our f of x then can be defined as what it is, meaning the way it is on top there, provided x is not equal to plus or minus two. And we can allow it to be one over four, provided x is equal to two. So now it has become continuous at that particular value. Okay. C f of x is equal to x squared minus one over x plus one at x is not equal to neg one and at c is neg one so on top difference of two squares immediately this is kicked away you remain with x minus one then what is f of negative one negative one minus one is negative two so immediately you find this value down here. Then you go back and say, okay, then my function that will be continuous now at that number is this provided x is not equal to negative one and it is negative two when x is negative one. The point here is after you resolve your function, when you substitute that value, 
if you are to sketch, you are supposed to open there because that value is not part of that domain. Now, for us to go back and close there, we redefine the function at the very point where it fails to be defined. So we fix it, and then it becomes continuous all of. That's the idea there. So you have D to try. Uh, just don't forget that to factorize your D. Uh, D is F of X is equal to X3 plus eight over X plus two. You want, for as long as this is not negative two, and you are checking at the very point. So I'll just give you a hint that to factorize the numerator there, I can use synthetic division or long division, and then you should be able to cancel out the x plus two, then pick your negative two, substitute in, in, in what you get, and after that, you define your function as that value at x is equal to that. Okay. Now we, we move to another section, which is question seven. Question seven uh, is dealing with, find the derivative of each of the following functions from the first principle. From the first principle. The first principle says that the derivative of any function is the same as the limit as h goes to zero of that very function you add this h where it is x subtract the full function divide by h now for a uh, f of x is equal to the root of x plus one so you say the f prime of this will be the limit as h goes to zero. Now f of x plus h means when you go to f, where there is x, substitute x plus h. So where there is x, we are going to have x plus h plus one minus the whole f of x then divide by h. So you know that if there was no h in the denominator, would have gone direct to substitute. But well, that's how you find the limit. And this time around, we can't do that because there's an h down there where we're avoiding a zero. So what you do is, these are sads now. You rationalize the numerator. Okay. So x plus h plus one minus x plus one multiplied by root of x plus h plus one plus x plus one. Divide by whatever you do in the numerator, you also do in the determinant. x plus h plus one plus x plus one. So you have the limit as h goes to zero. When you multiply this by that, you get the inside. And then when you multiply the other two, they will uh, cancel out. Now, okay, for the first time I'll do that. It will be x plus h plus one multiplied by x plus one minus x plus one multiplied by x plus h plus one. And then minus, and you multiply that by itself, you get x plus one over the generator here is not touchable. Plus one plus x plus one. So you can see that, um, you can see that this one and this one goes. So you remain with the limit as h goes to zero of x plus h plus one. When I expand that negative, I'll have that over h, the root of x plus h plus one plus x plus one. 
then this means that this one and that one, the one and the negative one. And so we have the limit as h goes to zero of h on top, h down, the root of x plus h plus one plus root of x plus one, like that. Then now this h and that h, so you leave a one down, a one here. So you are saying that we are now dealing with the limit as h goes to zero of one over the root of x plus h plus one plus x plus one. At this point now you can substitute whatever this h, we can take a zero because even if we do so, even if we do so, there's no harm. And that becomes our, our limit. So you should be careful whenever there is whenever you have assets to deal with, you should be able to rationalize to follow up very carefully. Very, very careful. Okay. B, you are looking for the f of x given is a quadratic. That this eight. So you do the same. You say its derivative will be given by first principle zero. Wherever there is x, we take x plus h, x plus h minus the full function three x squared plus four x minus eight over h. Of course, here I need to write this before substituting so that I don't get mixed up over h, okay? So that when I expand now, as h goes to zero, it will be three x squared plus two x h plus h squared plus four x plus four h minus eight minus three x squared minus four x plus eight over over h. So just here you can see that eight and that they are going, four x and this have gone, and then we remain the limit as h goes to zero. We now expand. We have three x squared, six x h, three h squared, four h, three x squared over h. Again here, this and that goes. So we remain with the limit as h goes to zero. You can factor out h from top there. So we have six h, I mean six x plus three h plus four over h. This h here is to cancel the generator. So we have the limit as h goes to zero, six h plus three h plus four. You can now substitute and get 6h plus 4 because where there is 6x plus 4, because where there is h, we take a 0. And of course, that's a, that's a derivative for that f of x there. Okay. So, what happens to c? The limit uh, f of x here is 1 over root one minus x. They're looking for its derivative. And by first principle, h must go to zero. And we must have this. And that over h. 
so that you have the limit as h goes to zero. f of x plus h, that's one minus x plus h minus one minus x over over h. So the first thing there is we work on the numerator. So it becomes one minus x minus h, common denominator, one minus x. And so that guy in here, we get the root of one minus x minus the root of one minus x minus h. Now when you're dividing by h is the same as multiplying the h just here. So that when you rationalize, so when I come back to rationalize now, I'll multiply the numerator by the root of one minus x plus the root of one minus x minus h. I will do the same to the denominator, one minus x plus one minus x minus h. I'll do that. So that um, we get the limit as h equals to zero, one minus x. And then those two will cancel. I demonstrated in the other one. So now when you cross, they will cancel and so it remains with minus one minus x minus h. And you can see that of course, over the whole denominator, um, over the whole denominator, one minus x minus h. One minus x. One minus x. One minus x minus h. So when you expand these brackets here, you can see that the, the signs will change. So when we expand these brackets, we're going to have minus here, plus here, plus here. And so you notice that again, this one and the one, negative x and the plus x, so only h should remain down. And so when only h remains, this part we erase. And that h will be divided here. So there will be one on top. So you get the limit. Well, actually, since there's a one now, then you go straight and substitute. So in the substitute value, this h we take zero, we will have the root of one minus x, the root of one minus x, and then we'll have one minus x root plus root of one minus x. And this is becoming one over these two and multiply, they give you one minus x outside. The other section gives you two, one minus x. You can write it. Anyway, if you want to say two, um, one minus x to the power one plus half, which is one over two, one minus x to the power three over two, which is the um, solution for that. Okay, so that was. C, then D, you try. It's the same thing, but it's just a fraction. One over X plus H minus three, minus that, and get a common denominator. And then immediately for this one, you'll see that on top, there'll be H remains, so it will cancel the down one. So that we got question eight. Differentiate with respect to X. 
a x4 minus 9 x3 plus 6. Now, in differentiating with respect to x, for this question, we're just using the four main basic rules power rule, product rule, quotient rule, chain rule. Now, before I can break down, before I bring the questions, let me just break down the, the rules. Power rule says if your f of x is equal to x to the power n, to get its derivative, to get its derivative, just drop the n and remain with n minus 1. Okay? Quotient rule says if the f of x is equal to u over v, to get the derivative, you say u derivative multiplied by v minus v derivative multiplied by u over v squared. Then Product rule. Product rule says if your f of x is equal to u v, then its derivative will be the derivative of u multiplied by v plus the derivative of v multiplied by u. And then there is chain rule. Says if your f of x is equal to u squared. Then the derivative of u, I mean, let me say, is equal to u to the power n. Let me not say squared to the power n. The derivative of u of this function will be n u n minus one multiplied by the derivative of u. Okay, so now let's bring down our questions. Question eight. A. So differentiate with respect to x. x to the power 4 minus 9x3 plus 6. So here we are using power rule. So we just say the derivative of this function, suppose we call this function y, then we we'll say the dy dx is going to be 4, because that's our n there, x. 4 minus 1 is 3, minus 3, 9x, not, not necessarily in brackets. Um, okay, so as the 3 comes down, it finds 9, so to multiply. 3 by 9, we get 27, and then x, 3 minus 1, we get 2. So for the constant, the power of x there is 0. That's why we are seeing 6x to the power 0, which is just 6. Then you drop the zero, everything disappears. Otherwise, you're saying the limit of the constant is zero. So that was A. Then B. So for B, I'll write it as y directly so that it then confuses x minus two. So this can also be written as x three, x minus two to the power half. So the derivative of dy dx is, here now we use product rule, remember, where you first hold and let your u to be x3, let your v to be x minus two to the power one over two. To find u prime, it is three x squared. To find v prime, you bring the half down and then the x minus 2, subtract the 1 from, remember I'm using that, subtract the 1 from half, you get negative half, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is 1. So this just gives us 1 over 2 root of x minus 2, because if the power is negative, you can take it down. Now half is the same as the square root. So the square root will be in the denominator, 
So now to put things together, uh, dy dx becomes u prime v. Uh, so we'll have three x squared v is x minus two plus v prime one over two root of x minus two multiplied by x three. So this is the derivative. So it's not confusing actually, it's just following the rules. C, here now we are using quotient rule. So if we say y is equal to x squared minus seven x plus four over x three plus two. So I'm equating them twice so that at least I can say dy dx. At least I have something to write. So dy dx in this case, is equal to using quotient rule. So we let u to by numerator and differentiate it. So we we'll get to x minus seven. Let v be our denominator and differentiate it. We'll get three x squared. Then from there, we'll have u prime v so now we need u prime v, remember? Caution true. We need u prime v minus v prime u over v squared. So u prime v, u prime v minus v prime u over v squared. And that is u prime is 2x minus 7. v is x squared. I mean, it's x3 plus 2 minus v prime is 3x squared and u is x squared minus 7x plus 4 over v squared, which is x3 plus 2 squared. Sometimes it's not even important to simplify. Then D, so that now I can use, so that now I can use a chain rule. So this is chain rule. You can see that when we let our U to be the inside, three X three minus X, our U prime is going to be three by three, nine X squared minus one. And so if you allow that one to be Y, then it would be saying dy dx is equal to, um, so it's like you're doing with u to the power six, okay? I mean, that, I mean, that's our function. We have written our y to be, so it's like now we are saying our y is u to the power six. So uh, dy dx is going to be uh, six u to the power five, multiply by the derivative of u. Going by the chain rule, and so we have six, what is our u? Three x three minus x to the power five and u prime, I found it here, nine x squared minus one. So this is our derivative. So E, you combine the chain rule and the quotient rule and you must make sure that you get it. Question nine. Use implicit differentiation to find dy dx. Implicit means you are trying to differentiate y with respect to x. Like the was saying y is equal to this function. And then you differentiate it, you get dy dx. And this time around, you have your y inside some function. You are unable to solve for y. So what do you do? You differentiate wherever it is and assume if you find it as a product you assume you are using product rule find it as a quotient you assume you are using quotient rule except that when you differentiate y you have to mention the dy dx showing that y is a holding function let's see what i mean a x squared y squared 8x 
2y minus 8 is 0. So you differentiate x squared to give us 2x. Okay? We differentiate y squared. If you take y, it will give us 2y. But this y must have been a function of x because we want to find y dx. So we mentioned it there because we just failed to solve for y. The derivative of 8x is 8. Of 2y is 2. But again, remember it is y. So dy at the x. The derivative of 8 is 0. Of 0 is 0. So from there now, you put together the dy dx. So you say dy dx. Then you have 2y here. Minus 2 is equal to you take negative 8 and negative 2x, okay? Then divide by 2y minus 2, divide by 2y minus 2. So you have dy dx is equal to negative 2x plus 4. The denominator also has 2y minus 1. So this can cancel. So you have negative x plus four. So if I want, I can take out the negative also there so that I have this. So this can go and have x plus four over one minus one. So it must be clear there. I just put out the, the negative in the denominator so that it could take out the one on top. Okay. So try this on B so that I do C. B is directly the same with this. What about C? X3 plus XY minus X squared, Y squared is equal to 7. So first, let's differentiate XY. That's a product. So you let u to be x, v to be y. u prime will be 1, v prime will be 1, but because it is y, it will be dy dx. So it will be 1 dy dx. We also get x squared, y squared. So if you want, you can get it as a negative, and then give a negative to, to some part. Let u b negative x squared so that u prime b negative 2x v b y squared so that v prime b 2y dy dx like that then now we come back and differentiate our function so x3 will give us 3x squared like that plus xy we're now using product two. So it will be u prime, which is one, this one multiplied by v, which is y, plus v prime multiplied by u, and u is x, v prime is dy, dx. Differentiating x squared, uh, negative x squared, y squared. Again, product rule, so we have negative u prime, which is negative two x, v, which is y squared, and then v prime, that, that will be minus 2x squared y dy dx is equal to 0. Then we put the dy dx together. What do we get? Uh, here there will be x minus 2x squared y. Then we take the other guys the other side. So we take 2x y squared uh, minus y, this y, minus this 3x squared. x squared, then we divide by x minus 2x squared y. We divide by x minus 2x squared y. So this and that goes. So we get dy, dx is equal to 2xy squared minus y minus 3x squared over x minus 2x 
Let's go on the line. So implicitly, that's how we get uh, the function. So it's an easy task to really, you don't really have to, to stress. You're just going there. When you find y uh, multiplying some function, some more, I mean some x or any, or any other variable, and you're due to respect to y, you differentiate y when you find it as if it was the only function that you have there. Except that after differentiating it, you just mentioned the dy dx. So you multiply the derivative of that y with respect to itself, you multiply it by dy dx. So you do that every time if you are taught to use implicit differentiation. Okay, so this ends uh, tutorial sheet seven. And so we are waiting for tutorial sheet 14. Thank you.